Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm very grateful to you all for coming, particularly at such a lovely day, summer weather. So indeed, I hope I'm going to give you a flavor of why you want to study the galaxy, what we know and what we don't know, and what are really, I think, the interesting questions uh, for the future. So first of all, what are we really doing when we're trying to understand the galaxy? What I focus on mostly is studying low-mass stars. These are ones that have lifetimes of order the age of the universe. This field has become called either galactic archaeology, studying the fossil record, mostly the elemental abundances that are locked into stars when they form. Galactic archaeology are actually near-field cosmology because the low-mass stars, stars of mass about the mass of the sun, as I mentioned, live a long time, essentially the age of the universe. They start to form, they basically break up the dark ages, start the reionization, form in the first structures. They're really telling us cosmology. They form at high redshift. It's very difficult, we'll see later, really to get absolute ages of old stars, but we know they're old, old being at least 10 billion years, maybe 13, maybe 13.555, you know, very shortly after the Big Bang, very high redshift. But in our current cosmology, an age of about 10 billion is a redshift of about two, so we're at least redshift two, and we'll see later, that's the peak of cosmic star formation. And there's lots of these old stars around us now. There's even old stars in the thin disk, but certainly ones in the halo, the bulge of the galaxy, the thick disk of the galaxy. We can get very large samples of these old stars, probe conditions at early times. And of course, the sequence of ages gives us conditions through the universe. We mentioned the fossil record. Stars do retain the memory of the initial conditions, the gas out of which they're formed. With a few rare exceptions, the elemental abundances on the surfaces reflect the elemental abundances of the gas out of which they're formed. Orbital information is quite often we can identify conserved quantities, the integrals of the motion. Now we'll be discussing how systems of stars and dark matter interact, and so there will be torques in those processes, there will be orbital angular momentum transport, orbital energy can go into internal degrees of freedom, but we look for structure in the joint space of kinematics and chemistry to identify groupings of stars from early times. An advantage of studying individual stars to sort of do near-field cosmology is that you can break some of the degeneracies that have plagued the analysis of integrated light of galaxies at high redshift. Integrated light meaning you get all the stars at once, all the stars along the line of sight that you're looking at within the galaxy, if you can resolve it spatially. Otherwise, you get all the light of the galaxy if you can't resolve it at very high redshift. And there's a well-known degeneracy between age and metallicity. Systems can be blue because they're young or blue because they're metal poor. But with stars, we can derive the metallicity from the strength of the spectral lines. We can break that degeneracy. There's also a degeneracy and in integrated light between star formation and the stellar initial mass function. Again, studying individual stars, we can break that degeneracy. We can count stars at the low mass end, they're always around. The luminosity function relatively easily gives us the mass function, sweeping a lot under the rug. And also, we can get a handle on the high mass IMF at high redshift because those stars produce a lot of the chemical elements that we now observe in low mass stars nearby. So there's a lot of information in individual stars. But of course, we need both studying 
old stars nearby is very complementary to studying high redshift galaxies, looking out at redshift 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. But of course, when we look at galaxies in different redshift slices, we're looking at different galaxies. And we have to try and piece out the family history, as it were. How do I associate galaxies at redshift 8 with the galaxies at redshift 3? So we're seeing snapshots of different galaxies at different epochs. Whereas when we study stars of different ages within one galaxy, we at least know which galaxy they're ending up in. So we're looking at the snapshots of one system as it ages. Very complementary, and of course we hope that we can reach similar conclusions both ways. We think the Milky Way is a typical disk galaxy, at least in its large-scale properties. Of course, it's the one that we can study in most detail. So it's evolution of the Milky Way, if we can decipher that from studying the stars, that should tell us the dominant physical processes in how you form a typical large disk galaxy, which is, of course, a typical galaxy. About 40% of light in the nearby universe is in disks. In the local group, we can also study individual stars in M31, M33, also disk galaxies. We'd like to be able to compare and contrast. Much more limited data on these galaxies now. I'm not going to be discussing them. I'll just alert you to the Subaru Prime Focus Spectrograph. This is a project in which I'm involved, Hopkins is involved. Love to talk more to you about it later. This will be a multi-object spectrograph on the Subaru telescope, obviously, which will have about 2,400 fibers over a one and a half degree field of view. Really spectacular facility. And we plan a survey of red giants in M31, hopefully a lot more information on M31 soon. Mostly observations I've been talking about. Now, of course, we're at this nexus, we have great computers now, great simulation software, and now we're really able to run simulations of Milky Way-like galaxies in a full cosmological context, almost getting down to high enough resolution with hydro codes to do individual star formation. Still not quite there, but this is a great time that we're getting all the data and we're getting the modeling too. What you would hope to in your theories is that when you do the simulations, the Milky Way should not be too unusual. And as we'll touching on later, how unusual is the Milky Way? So uh, I'm going to give an overview mostly with focus on the disks and the halo. Not going to be saying very much about the bulge uh, in the interests of time. So if we're talking about disks in Halo, what can we learn from disk stars? Well, the insight has been around a long time, maybe coming from very nice reviews of Jerry Ostreicher in the 1980s. Oops, sorry. Thin stellar disks are fragile. The stars have cold kinematics, low velocity dispersion relative to the azimuthal streaming velocity. They can be disturbed by either external influences, small satellite galaxies, large satellite galaxies, but also can be disturbed by internal perturbations, spiral arms, giant molecular clouds, causing perhaps the heating that we see in the velocity dispersion age relation in thin disks. Stellar systems are collisionless. For the students, of course, the sizes of stars are very much less than the distances between them. They don't often interact by colliding. We'll be mentioning later some situations, perhaps, where that happens. But in general, no. What that means is if you heat the stars, if you inject energy into the internal degrees of freedom, increasing the random motions, the velocity dispersions, Unlike gas, I can't collide two stars, have them radiate away the energy. Stars, once heated, stay hot. Gas, if you heat it, can cool by radiating energy. Gas is dissipational. 
but uh, stars, no. So that means if I study the vertical structure of disks as a function of age, as a function of chemistry, I can get information on the heating history of the stars and place constraints on the relative importances of heating, dissipational settling, when did stars form, etc., by looking at the vertical structure. By looking at the radial structure of disks, I can get in, and by structure, I should say, I mean structure in its fullest meaning. So, what, how do the kinematics vary as a function of height in the plane and distance? How do the chemical abundance distributions vary, structure in age distribution, etc.? So the radial structure could perhaps tell us the star formation history as a function of radius, uh, imprints of angular momentum redistribution by looking at how the chemical abundances vary with the angular momentum of the stars as a function of radius, etc. Get some handle on have disks been rearranging themselves. I won't have time to mention this much, but a lot of current interest in something called radial migration, moving stars radially within disks. Uh, we'll be discussing the thin disk, thick disk dichotomy, the earliest phases of disk formation. Again, as I mentioned, the merger history of the Milky Way is in large part written in the age distribution of the stars as a function of height. I have a thick disk, we'll see a thin disk, Thin disks form out of gas, stars, young stars forming out of gas. I have to get the gas coming in. Uh, we'll see that the thin disk is not completely thin. We'll see that I can identify, we can identify bending and breathing modes in the thin disk, buckling and expanding discuss that this can tell us about what's causing strub structure in the thin disk. And then, as I just briefly <coughs> mentioned, stellar radial migration within the thin disk as a response to these perturbations within the thin disk. So all this is in the structure of thin and thick disk in galaxies. What about what can we learn from the halo stars? Well, again, I have to say the first paper I read really pointing out that because the field halo stars are at very low density, they probably didn't form that way, but formed in disrupted systems was Jerry Ostreicher. Uh, so they formed, most possibly, in disrupted systems. Indeed, we think that most star formation happens in clusters, some of which become unbound very quickly. And if we look in the halos of galaxies, we see basically two kinds of candidates for the systems that would be disrupted star clusters. Almost by definition, what is the difference between a star cluster and a galaxy? They would have no dark matter. But we also see dwarf galaxies, which have dark matter, so that would also contribute to the halo if, if they got disrupted, as we think they do. Difference here, dwarf galaxies can have self-enrichment with supernovae. Each of the dwarfs would have stars of a much wider range of ages than the star clusters, individual star cluster, and would have a much larger range in chemical abundances. So we would hope to be able to try and identify which fraction of the field halo came from star clusters, globular star clusters, and what fraction come from dwarfs, again looking for particular patterns in the elemental abundances and looking for correlations between the abundances and the kinematics. Also learned from the halo by studying the highest velocity stars, we can understand what's the escape velocity, what is the potential well as a function of radius of the Milky Way. 
Uh, that, of course, tells us about dark matter we'll be coming to. And also, if we get really extreme velocity stars, that can tell us about the interactions of systems of stars with the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. Again, I won't have time to talk about this, but I have a couple of recent papers. I love to talk to people about it using the latest Gaia data. What else? There's tidal streams, probably from the disrupted dwarf galaxies, a lot from the star clusters too. Again, I won't have time to talk about much of that. But again, accretion history, looking in detail at the structure and the orbits, tell us about the symmetry of the dark halo. Lambda CDM says dark halos should be triaxial. Are they? Probably not. Quite at the level. How much of that is the baryons influencing the shape of the potential? We don't really know. Tidal streams, if I could identify gaps in them, perhaps that could be caused by the impact of some substructure through it. Could be a giant molecular cloud if it went through the plane. Could also be dark substructure. And of course, surviving dwarf galaxies, there's a lot of information. I'm saying they're also in the halo. In particular, a lot of focus right now is on using the stellar kinematics within these dwarf galaxies to try to determine the dark matter density profile. The dwarf spheroidals around the Milky Way have very low baryon mass. And so that's a situation where what I just mentioned, the influence of baryons back on the dark halos should be minimal. However, there's a discussion right now about, well, actually, maybe even in these very low baryon mass systems, relatively high dark matter domination in the centers, there might have been strong enough star formation bursts to affect the density profile. But we'll just mention this in a minute. Dark matter density profile from the starlight seems to suggest the dark matter profile is a core, not a cusp. Why is this important? Well, one of the overall reasons that I became interested in studying the Milky Way, uh, when I did my thesis in Cambridge, I was a theoretical cosmologist. I worked on actually the epoch of recombination. Uh, but I also got very interested in galaxy formation as a way of trying to figure out what is dark matter, what type of dark matter is there. And this is very relevant right now. Why? Small scales are where the nature of dark matter becomes apparent. This is a plot. Again, it's from Jerry Ostreicher. <laughs> Jerry Ostreicher and Paul Steinhardt, just showing you predictions of lots of different types of dark matter. On the left, we have predictions for the number of systems as a function of mass. And on the right, we have density in the central regions as a function of mass. And uh, what you see is that the mass scales go from large scales, clusters of galaxies, down to dwarf galaxies. This is the scale of a typical galaxy. Again, here, dwarf clusters. And what do you see? You see that on large scales, where gravity dominates, basically all dark matter gives you the same answer. And that's because gravity dominates. Once you get on the scales of a large galaxy, which is what we're studying, that's where you start to see the physics of dark matter. The different types here, this is fuzzy dark matter, which I've also worked on. These are ultra low mass axions. These are systems where you really have to start worrying about quantum physics and solve the Schrodinger equation. They're kind, of, they're kind of fun. You can see they suppress structure on small scales. CCDM is cold collisionless dark matter. The prediction I'm sure most of you know, lots of structure on small scales if you have collisionless dark matter, warm dark matter, self-annihilating dark matter, very sad, also suppresses structure on small scales. But cold dark matter, Lots of structure on small scales. 
many small galaxies, many small dark halos as well, and it predicts a cusp in the inner density profile, which is why it's interesting and, uh, that the observations for the dwarf galaxies suggest there's a core. But again, physics of dark matter starts to become apparent here. These are some old snapshots, not showing any movies, just to remind you that called dark matter, there are lots of power on small scales. Early times to late times, this is from Mike Ball and Colchin a few years ago, just showing you lots of, this is dark matter only, light has high density, lots of small structure merges together, hierarchical clustering to form a bigger system today. This is a very old plot, which I really like. This is from Ben Moore, 1999. Again, early times, a half a giga year after the Big Bang. Now, where this was an early attempt, and people are still doing this. I, again, dark matter only. Uh, he's painted in red, the highest density. Can't quite see it forming stars at early times. Where do they end up now? A lot of them do end up in the central object, and this is what we study. So what's predicted? Active merger history for Milky Way-like halos, all these small systems to big. Lots of surviving substructure. So this was the paper that basically defined what became known as the missing satellite problem. And it was quite funny that this was presented by Ben Moore at a meeting in Aspen, it was a winter meeting in 1998. Ben Moore went, went first and then Tolly Clippin came second. If you know Tolly Clippin, he's a, uh, don't wish to be stereo, well, no. He's very excitable, we'll put it that way. <laughs> and Brian, and um, so Ben Moore, presented this and said, look at all this substructure, way more than we see structure about the Milky Way now. And Tolly Clippin jumped up and said, you stole my slides. Because it was one of those occasions where two groups came to exactly the same conclusion at exactly the same time. And that has persisted. I mean, some small changes, but there really is too much substructure. We're finding more dwarf galaxies, of course, but again, there's still a discrepancy. So active merger history, and I need to speed up. So we have these mergers going on. So what happens? Well, of course, what happens when a dark matter halo comes in with some stars inside it, it depends on all the parameters of the two systems. It's going to be tidally stripped, depending on its orbit, depending on the relative density between the satellite and the host interior to its orbit, and on its mass, more massive satellites <coughs> sink, denser satellites survive longer, so dense, massive satellites probably going to contribute to the central regions. What the stars look like in that debris is going to be determined by the star formation history as a function of radius within the dwarf galaxy that's coming in. We know there's a mass metallicity relationship. We know star formation history sets the elemental abundances. Come back to that later. Lambda CDM, you can make predictions that at a given redshift, lower mass halos are more concentrated, so they're more robust, but the concentration is lower at higher redshifts. So it's a little bit complicated, but they end up saying high mass halos should be disrupted at early times in the inner halo. Lower mass systems would contribute to the outer halo later in the universe. Time scales are longer out there too, and so there'll be streams in the outer halo. If there's a thin disk present at the time of the mergers, to merger, you have two systems, you end up with one. I have to do something with the orbital energy that goes into the internal degrees of freedom of the one system that's left. 
causing an I increase in the velocity dispersion of the stars. I have to do something with the orbital angular momentum as well. That too is absorbed into the big system, causes a tilt in the angular momentum axis. Can also, as it's merging, cause modes in the disk. These are these bending, breathing modes. This is just a snapshot from a paper from Mike Cooper, stellar halos of six Milky Way mass dark halos, lots of structure in the outer regions. This is from Eric Bell, Sloan star counts, saying, well, actually, maybe not so much like this. Most of the structure is in a few very well-defined structures. And uh, we'll come back to that later. Was it a few big things or not that dominate the star counts? So what do we see when we look up and do star counts? These are star counts at intermediate latitudes. That means uh, galactic latitude about 45. This is Sloan. What you see are two very well-defined main sequence turnoffs. Sorry, apparent magnitude versus color. When you have a system with a very s slowly varying density profile, as the thick disk and the halo do, then you basically see uh, at ever in increasing faintness the turn off the brightest stars on the main sequence at blue color. So we can see one turn off that's uh, a bluer one and a redder one. When you get the kinematics and the chemistries of stars in this color range, this magnitude range, this is a paper we wrote in 2013. These have kinematics of thick disk, intermediate metallicity. These have halo kinematics, much lower metallicity. So we knew there were these two turnoffs. They're old, very few stars, bluer, well-defined old turnoff. So in the 80s was when the thick disk was really uh, first defined geometrically through star counts, a thin disk and a thick disk. Star counts as a function of distance from the plane. Thin disk, 300, thick about one kiloparsec in uh, the vertical exponential scale height. Actually, one puzzle again I can't d have time to discuss is why, uh, why exponentials. Uh, and as I say, we know the kinematics intermediate between the thin disk and the halo. We measured the velocity dispersion, we being this group of people down here. The vertical velocity dispersion that was measured was basically, t excuse me, too high to have resulted from internal heating processes. Probably did require an exceptional event, as we'll see, perhaps such as a merger. Uh, again, has a mean metallicity of about a third to a half solar. Elemental abundance is alpha enhanced, old, and it has a derived mass. It was a bit uncertain what still is, what's the scale length, but very significant component of the disk. I mentioned elemental abundances. Let's just discuss that a bit more. Tells you a lot about the star formation history and the enrichment history. And we turned in the, basically the last decade or so from a geometric interpretation of the thick disk. People were arguing, is it really distinct to a chemical definition in elemental abundance space because this old age and fewer younger stars is a very different star formation history, gives very different patterns in elemental abundances to between the thick disk and the thin disk. So again, alpha elements are produced through core collapse supernovae, massive stars, iron comes both from core collapse supernovae, but also type 1a supernovae on much longer time scales. So different elements are produced from progenitors of, of different mass on very different time scales. So at early times, 
when I have a star formation event, I have enrichment only from the massive stars through core collapse supernovae. I get lots of alpha elements, successive addition of a helium nucleus, oxygen, magnesium, etc. And they give enhanced alpha to iron, oxygen being an alpha element, enhanced with respect to the sun. At later times, I get type 1a, give me a lot of iron, so only core collapse supernovae plus iron from type 1a gives me a turn down because I'm adding iron, I'm not adding any more oxygen. Well, I can add some more oxygen, but I'm also adding iron, and it is a turn down. So this, turn, this break here, referred to as the knee, tells you when you're starting to get significant contribution from type 1a supernovae from stellar evolution. We think that's a few times 10 to the 8 to start to have the explosions. They have a very long time scale, depending on the parameters of your model for the type 1a. Start to see significant iron, maybe a giga year after the start, start of star formation. How that corresponds to iron depends on the star formation history, the chemical enrichment. So for slower enrichment, as you might see in the thin disk, you would see a turn down at lower iron because you just haven't produced that many stars. Faster enrichment, you would see the knee at higher iron. Of course, once we have ages, hopefully we would see this, you see in a minute. And we then realize this is what you see. Here's what you observe for titanium. This is Benz Bay et al. Also notice this IMF point here. This is part of the IMF dependencies. But this is what we see, thick disk and thin disk, two sequences. Another plot here. Now. These are giant stars for which there's an estimate of the age. Again, two sequences, alpha as a function of, this is alpha to metallicity, it's a function of metallicity, labeled by age, red, old ages, young ages in the thin disk. So the thick disk probes the earliest phase of the disk formed at redshift 2, as we've mentioned, high velocity dispersion, short time scale of star formation, enhanced alpha, narrow range of ages, probably formed prior to equilibrium, virilization of the halo. Uh, this was also part of my thesis, was the first theoretical model for how you would form a thick disk just at the time that it was being discovered by Reed and Gilmore, so then we started to work together. Uh, there are lots of papers discussing that this is the epoch of active merging, maybe turbulent gas. Indeed, the mass of the thick disk in the inferred star formation rate from the mass and the time of duration says that it does look similar to what we actually observe in disk galaxies at redshift 2. As I mentioned, complementary approaches, do we see the same thing? Uh, what's observed is organized rotation in H-alpha. It's in the ionized gas that they can now get. This is IFU observations. You can get the kinematics of the gas has rotation velocities similar to what we see in the thick disk, large internal velocity dispersion. What we want to know is how does that evolve? Again, needing sequences of, gal of galaxies at different redshifts. So I think we need to use our uh, thin disks as a guide. Here is the redshift to disk galaxies from Emily Wisnowski's 2015 paper. This is H alpha. This is the broadband images H alpha. This is the velocity dispersion. This is the rotation velocity, color coded by uh, this is the line of sight velocity. These are disks, red going away, blue coming towards us, red going away. These are different galaxies. You can see organized rotation, 
just recent, everybody was going, oh, these are big disks. Yes, they're fat. But this is the ionized gas settling, it, perhaps it's settling into equilibrium. A uh, nice paper by Mark Krumholtz, what drives turbulence in star formation regions, maybe gravitational driving. So maybe this turbulence is actually driven by a merger. Caution, people are now actually using ALMA to study the neutral gas and are discovering it shows cooler kinematics. So maybe the actual disk in which stars are forming is not as puffy and thick. I really do need to move along. Sorry, I'm going more slowly than I expected. Um, how might we form these thick disks through mergers? As I mentioned, you take two systems, you end up with one, the orbital energy goes into the internal degrees of freedom of the disk, you can just scale it, sort of, the increase in velocity dispersion of the disk is going to go like the ratio of the masses of the two systems merging times the orbital energy v squared. And that just about works. And this is a simulation from Amina Helmi and Villa Lobos showing an initial disk, there's a satellite on a prograde orbit comes in, you don't see the satellite. Energy goes in to the internal degrees of freedom, puffs it up, much <coughs> thicker disk. Notice the tilting too as it absorbs the orbital angular momentum. This is a one to five collisionless merger. That's the mass ratio of the disk to the satellite. Uh, notice if there's gas, um, you get less heating, that's what this does it scale with the one or the second power of the ratio. Phil Hopkins has done some work on this because uh, gas can radiate energy, more mergers cause more heating. It's a generic prediction of lambda CDM that you get thick disks. The merging continues to late times. Generic prediction is you get a range of stellar ages in the thick disk. I'm going to focus, oops, on this issue, where is the satellite debris? If this is how you form a thick disk, we have various models, then if it's a satellite that did it, and it's a fairly massive satellite, we should be able to find the debris. And again, why is uh, the thick disk important? Why is the age that I've been discussing important? So I just mentioned, whenever you have a merger and you have a pre-existing thin disk, you're going to get heating. You're going to put stars of all ages in the thin disk to larger scale heights. So you're going to see stars puffed up with all the range of ages that you have in the thin disk at the time of that merger. If I have a very late merger like now, I would scatter up stars up to essentially zero ages. What we see in the thick disk is old ages. So there hasn't been a merger big enough to really scatter all the stars up since a look back time corresponding to 10 billion years. That's what we're talking about here. Dominant old age implies no significant merger relatively quiet history for the Milky Way. Is that what we see in the predictions from uh, the Lambda CDM simulations? At face value, no. At face value, the Milky Way is very unusual. However, well, we need more detailed predictions. We really need to pin down the stellar ages so, but it is looking as though the Milky Way has a relatively quiet merger history. If you can push back this redshift to redshift 3, then the Milky Way starts to be in the 1% category in terms of lambda CDM halos of the mass of the Milky Way. It's important to figure out the old age. It's important to try and figure out the merger history. Here's a typical disk galaxy in Lambda CDM. 
Maya Tal 2017, part of the FIRE collaboration. This is density in starlight as a function of height, just showing they get exponentials. This is age as a function of height above the plane and radius. It's a Milky Way analog. Here's the sun. This blue up to above a kiloparsec is an age of 3 billion years. That reflects the fact that the last significant merger was at a look back time of about 6 billion years. So you're seeing as that merger settles down, you're seeing the puffing up of stars that were formed in the thin disk at that time. This is much younger than we see in our galaxy. We did not have a significant merger that recently ago. Uh, just again, these are ages from Ness et al, ages from Kepler seismology calibrations. This age is 12 billion years at a height of a kiloparsec above the plane, not 4 billion years. Oops. Have we seen any satellite debris from this last merger? Well, we made a claim in 2002 that we had seen the satellite. This is kind of the smoking gun. Was it a merger? Can we tie it all together? Uh, and we said we see stars that show a lag in the azimuthal velocity that's much larger than was expected. We thought thick disk should be on cylindrical rotation and we thought it was satellite debris, satellites on prograde orbits may be favored. And then it was realized later from a lot of work from Alessandra there that it's not true that thick disks rotate on cylinders, i.e. constant V phi as a function of height, but there are kinematic and metallicity gradients within the thick disk. What do we see in the Gaia era? Can I take a few times, a few minutes to go through? Uh, how much has it changed? How much is it still open? Well, I showed you the star count's apparent magnitude as a function of color showing two turnoffs. Of course, with Gaia, we can go to absolute magnitude, not apparent, and you see, yeah, we were right, there really are two turnoffs. You can see exquisite detail of the turnoffs. Uh, that this is to print out all the, all the younger stars, there's a cut on the tangential velocity. These are the high tangential velocity stars. I hope you can see to yellow, the color coding is the density and the color magnet, the absolute magnitude color diagram. Here's two isochrones, again, halo metallicity, old blue sequence, old thick disk metallicity going through red. What about this merger debris? Well, there have been two claims. Koppelman et al. said there's a retrograde substructure extending to quite high energies. This is energy, angular momentum. These should be conserved quantities. There's a box here. They said this is retrograde structure and they said this is debris from a satellite in a retrograde orbit, not a prograde orbit. Doesn't couple so well to the disk. So that was a bit surprising, but they said that. They then cross-correlated with Apogee and said, look, these stars have got low alpha abundances. This is consistent with forming in systems of low star formation rate, that lower sequence on that plot of alpha to iron versus iron. And so they, this is more evidence that these stars have been accreted. <coughs> A different claim using proper motions from the cross correlation of Sloan and Gaia DR1 said, well, actually, we find different structure, or maybe it's the same. We're still trying, this is one of the puzzles. Is this the same structure? Is it different structure? What are we seeing? Very radially anisotropic prograde component in the halo that they called the sausage. If you've heard of the Gaia sausage, this is it. This is supposed to be sausage shaped in the plot of 
iron versus arc, the radial component of the space motions. This sausage basically caused by the fact that the velocity distribution is very far from Gaussian as you're taught that, you know, <laughs> velocities are Gaussian. It's double peaked. This, this is observed close to the sun. What's happening? Well, these are stars going past us on very radial orbits towards the center. We're seeing them going that way and then going back out again, going that way. So we get the double peaked. And the, the, these plots are actually from Nesub et al, not from Belukharov et al. A claim that we've seen associated globular clusters with each of these two different structures. Helmi includes omega sen in that structure. Mayung, who was a student of Vasily Belukharov, says, well, there's a different structure associated with omega sen but there do seem to be globular clusters with similar kinematics. So I think there it clearly is substructure in the local halo, consistent with dwarf galaxies. Not clear it has the appropriate narrow range of ages to have been the debris that caused the thick disk that long ago. It's also, there's some debate about whether it has the right kinematics, should this be more dispersed by now? So there's sort of ongoing discussion about that. We need a more global view. This is very local, stars passing past the sun. I'm not going to have time, but we can discuss offline. Uh, we really need to know what's the age distribution. As we just mentioned, uh, this accreted sequence, it used to be that the halo just had enhanced alpha. As we got better data, starting from Nissen and Schuster, it became obvious that there really are two sequences in the halo, as there's two sequences in the disks. And uh, we really need good detailed elemental abundance information and good models if we want to get isochrone ages for stars. And we really need to know age metallicity, age alpha abundance correlations to understand the sequence of the merger. We have a great chance in our galaxy to look in detail at the physics of the merging process, but only if we can really understand ages and kinematics and how they all correlate together. Uh, this is old data, elemental abundances. I say we thought the, thick di the halo and the thick disk showed enhanced. Nissen and Schuster got better data, so there's two sequences. We can now, this is a cartoon from Hawkins, 2015. Canonical halo, accreted halo. Notice, here's a puzzle. Why is it coincidental that the accreted halo, which has very hot kinematics and elemental abundance is it's remarkable. It goes straight onto the thin disk and a lot of the elements. That really is a puzzle, what's going on there. Well, other puzzles and things that as we get more data, we think we understand and we realize we don't. Age trends within the local thick disk. This is a plot of alpha to iron ag against age paper from Misha Haywood with a model through it too, chemical evolution model. This is the thick disk at low metallicities, high ages, continuous sequence down. Those were ages derived from isochrone fitting. Here's a different plot of the same thing, alpha to iron versus age. This is high alpha, the thick, the high alpha sequence. There is no trend. These ages, this is a Kepler, complete Kepler sample. Uh, you know, they say, well, we need more data to understand what's going on. This is a complete sample. This is not. Notice we think there are blue stragglers. How many of those are there? What's going on? Halo disk, some halo substructure we now think could actually be disturbed disk instead of halo. 
we mentioned there's effect on the uh, disc. Don't have time to go through this, but we see oscillatory structure in star counts. More stars to the north, more stars to the south, more stars to the north. We see these corrugation waves. We see oscillatory kinematics in many uh, surveys. I had to show what I think is the most beautiful result from Gaia so far, the Gaia spiral. What is this? This is phase space mixing. This is a plot of vertical height, vertical velocity, color coded by the azimuthal streaming velocity. The Gala spiral. It's also seen in Gala. Uh, this is stars within one kiloparsec of the solar radius. Again, vertical velocity, vertical position, color coded by azimuthal streaming velocity. Are you ahead or are you behind local circular velocity? What's going on? I think the best paper is one by James Binney and Ralph, Sh Ralph Schoenrich saying this is what you get if you have a disc and you hit it with a, pert with a perturber, and of course we have one, the Sagittarius dwarf, goes through the disc. In the disc, the frequency at which the stars oscillate vertically depends on the angular momentum, this azimuthal streaming velocity, in addition to the amplitude of vertical oscillations. And the way this works is that then, because the frequencies are all different, you get this phase wrapping and you should get it, and we even have models predicting this. What we need, comprehensive survey of the outer disk. I think <coughs> to go from very local, what's happening, the Sagittarius dwarf went through the disk further out, and I think we're going to get that, so I will just conclude. I think we're seeing the combination of Gaia and spectroscopy is, you know, it's immensely powerful, but the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. I think has been true, is true, will be true for a while, and we really need ages. We need large samples with which we can define very well-defined small samples, get far from the sun, and we need a lot more modeling as well. Thank you. Okay. 30 years of uh, studies of the galaxy of the disk. Yeah. Questions? Yep, there's one. And the others? So, starting from your last remark, as you said, so you had a time scale for the perturbation of the Sagittarius work from the disk. So, is that consistent with the fact that you say that there was no major merger? No. Uh, and the second part of the question would be uh, the fact that the disk is so quiet is that it's probably very, 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 very consistent with the fact that we don't have many substructures as the longest in the end. So, in that case, not only you should see many substructures, but you should also see many particular disks mm -hmm. in the universe and especially for the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's see, let's step back. Uh, <coughs> what I thought you were going to ask was actually, and I'll ask that, I'll answer that question first. Uh, does the passage, the time scale since Sagittarius went through the disk, does that work with this current amplitude of the Gaia spiral? Because it's also going to wrap up and disappear and in fact that works because as you probably know Sagittarius is now coming up on the other side of the galactic center so it went down half an orbit ago approximately which is a few hundred million years which is just the time scale you need to get that kind of amplitude so is this a, a very significant merger no this is one of the later time mi minor mergers so it's not in conflict with saying that there hasn't been a five to one since then. Now, back to your question of where are all the missing satellites? 
as I alluded to, I think the quiet history in the Milky Way and in other uh, spirals, in particular, you know, we see things called the ultra thins, very, very thin disk, very difficult to understand that if it's constantly being bombarded by small dark substructures. So I think uh, one of the reasons that I worked on fuzzy dark matter, as I say, I worked on that, is that I really think that we should be exploring alternative models of dark matter uh, that don't predict as much small-scale substructure. I think we really have a chance with our galaxy to really try and understand the nature of dark matter by trying to understand substructure, the merging history, dark matter profile, Although in our galaxy, uh, they're so, it's so dominated by baryons in the center that it's rather hard to figure out the dark matter profile in the center, which is where studying the dwarfs comes, comes into it. Yeah, no, it, that's a very valid point. Mm. So you mentioned the different results that have been seen with the guy there with regards to evidence of a major merger or some kind of past. Um, which would suggest maybe the, the reason for why we have a thick disk. Mm -hmm. um, even though, as it, like you said, it's not clear whether everyone's seeing exactly the same thing, but what are the ra age range in terms of how long ago did this merger take place? Are they getting about the same numbers there? Well, the thing is, um, if you read the Helmi paper, then their argument was, is exactly the same as the argument I used in 2001, which comes from the age distribution in the thick disk. And that's 10 billion years. So that's where their time scale comes from. One reason I said, um, does it have the right range of ages, wherever it is, I don't know. Uh, well, we can amuse ourselves. Um, is here. Do we know, A, the ages of those stars, do we know them well enough, the stars in the debris? Because presumably, when the satellite came in, although there may have been, uh, well, let's step back. In this picture, for the thick disk to be a puffed up thin disk, and to have the mass it has, that says there was a really quite a massive thin disk already in place. So we're also saying that, mo that a lot of the potential well of the whole Milky Way was in place at that time. So presumably then, which also doesn't really agree that well with Lambda CDM, right? that we've already got a big disk in place. Um, so presumably there's probably also gas in the halo, as we observe in galaxies. So that means when the satellite came in, it would have been stripped of what gas it has. So it would maybe have a burst of star formation due to ram squeezing, but then it would be suppressed. So again, you could use the ages of stars in the debris to date when it came in, and that should agree. They seem to be reasonably typical halo in terms of their age, in that they're not really sticking out. So people have tried to model this in terms of, uh, if we go back, well, we don't need to go back. We have a plateau where we have just type two supernovae, then we have a knee once we start to get type one supernovae. So we're talking a few giga years, maybe, in terms of the chemical evolution. Before, before yes, yes, yes. So maybe, you know, starting at 13. Minus three is about yeah, you know, I mean, maybe. Uh, the globular clusters that may or may not be associated. Uh, I don't have a plot here, but uh, globular clusters, we can get much better ages for the cluster than we can for individual stars, because as I was trying to argue <laughs> here, um, you know, I think our ages are old ages. We need a lot more work understanding what's going on here. But um, 
depending on which clusters you associate with the debris, either they're all older than 10 or some of them are younger. That's why I'm saying it's not clear at present uh, whether the age distribution really matches what you have. It, it's part of the ongoing puzzles. Yes. Sorry.